yeah, welcome again to everyone who's in chat. Nice to see all of you. Um, and thanks for being here. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start uh, kind of introducing what's going on. As you know, this is the final presentations of um, the fall 2020 Baby Castles residency. Uh, we've got four residents. Um, this was the first time we've been able to do uh, this program. Um, we got a, a donation from Maxwell Neil Cohen, so shout out to you. Thanks uh, if you're in the chat. Um, feel free to say hi. Um, but yeah, so this is the first time we've been able to do this as Baby Castles, and we're really excited um, to be able to do it. Um, we had uh, Naomi Clark and uh, Clara Fernandez um, help us uh, choose applicants, um, so thanks to them as well. Uh, and we've had a lot of great guest artists like come in and work with us. So thanks to all of you if, if you're also in the audience. Um, and yeah, it's just been it's been really exciting to see um, everyone's work uh, just take form over the past three months. Uh, this residency started in mid-October. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know. Hi, Cynthia, do you wanna say anything else before we start kicking it off? No, just that the the work that's come out of it has been super impressive, and we're we're yeah. super happy to have been able to work with everyone that everything that you're going to see tonight. Um, yeah, uh, I guess do, do we want to introduce ourselves and like our role in this or like anything like that or? Oh sure, yeah. I mean, um, does that my matter? Is, yeah. <laughs> my name is Juan, um, and yeah, yeah, you can say. And I assent. We were kind of like the the coordinators um, of of this program for for this cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, kind of Lauren uh, Gardner is also helping behind the scenes as well as uh, Lee Tussman um, and the rest of the Baby Castles volunteers. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh yeah, a lot of the residents have also given workshops or are going to give workshops uh, in addition um, to their projects. So um, you can watch the, uh, the, the VOD video of uh, Alan's workshop. Um, that should be on our Twitch and probably our YouTube. It's on um, our YouTube, yeah. Nice. And um, and yeah, Kevin will talk about DigiMits, which is coming up in the future. Um, but yeah, I'll give him the chance to talk about that. Um, so uh, without much further ado, um, first uh, presenter for tonight is going to be Kevin. Um, I'll let him introduce himself uh, and his project. Um, but yeah, take it away. Cool. OK, awesome. Uh, thank you, Juan and Hyacinth. First off, you know, I would like to uh, give a shout out to my fan girls out there, mom, grandma, <laughs> sister. I appreciate you all coming out to this and supporting me like you always have. Um, I'm going to share my screen and we will go away. So uh, I want to start by saying, you know, thank you to Baby Castles for running this residency to begin with. Um, it was definitely a extremely awesome opportunity and, um, you know, it was really great to see all of the dif differing types of work that all of the different residents were doing. And um, I'm really excited to have done this and really appreciative of the space that Juan and Hyacinth and the Baby Castles organization has created. So thank you all and uh, you know, thanks to the residents for all of the amazing things they're going to show tonight as well. So to start uh, about myself, you know, I graduated from Lucy in 2016 and then Valencia Community College in 2013. I was born and raised in Queens, New York, uh, born and based and then raised in Orlando, Florida. Uh, first generation Colombian American. I've spent the last couple of years working primarily as like a graphic designer and web developer and kind of just figuring out how to survive in New York. So this residency was kind of the first time that uh, I've been able to work on kind of my own personal things in, in a while. So as stated, uh, I am from, or my family is from Colombia. Um, mom came over in the 90s and I was born here and I kind of have gone to visit every couple of years um, throughout maybe my young adolescence until, um, until I was a teenager. But nowadays really uh, maybe going on Google Maps and looking at what the mountain city that my family is from called Armenia is, um, looks like is probably as close as I've gotten in about the last 10 years. And so I was really planning on trying to go out to Colombia this year uh, during the summer and kind of reconnect with my family and just the area out there. Uh, but as you know, COVID has kind of really made that uh, impossible to, to do. And so that kind of formed this like desire to go 
to this place that has held like such a space, such an idea and like place in my heart um, and not being able to is kind of the crux of what my project was about and trying to find other ways to connect with uh, Colombia, my culture, heritage and so on and so forth. And primarily trying to do that from um, from like, I guess the main source of where a lot of my learnings come from and that being my family, but also trying to figure out how something like this could mix with my own interests, such as, uh, you know, coding, computation, the web, um, as a way to kind of explore in this personal manner. So I kind of just started out uh, by like, um, kind of just asking uh, my family members about just, I don't know, different stories or things that they grew up with or things that they remember from, you know, their time in Colombia. And my mom had told me about how in my great grandmother's bathroom, there was a bag with a finger bone inside of it. And I was so extremely like surprised about it. I was just like, what, what is this doing here that I went and then asked my grandmother about it. Uh, and this was her response where she's basically saying like, we don't know why it was there, um, but we think that they brought it from Libano, which is the other the city that my grandmother's family is originally from, uh, and that they kept it as a sort of safe keeping when it was no longer possible to visit, to visit the, uh, the grave anymore. And so then from that, I kind of just started collecting all of these stories from my fa different family members. First from, <clears throat> first from my grandmother, but then also another one, for example, uh, from my dad, who kind of talked about how in the middle of the night, there would be these sounds that he would hear and that it was from La Señora con Tacones, which means the woman with heels. And that um, you would hear her, you would hear her heels, but you couldn't actually see her, um, see her like walking or moving through the streets. And so that that really kind of scared him when he was when he was younger. And then from that, I started to think about like, okay, if my family and these stories are like an entry point into like, you know, what it was like being there, like, what are some things that I can then tie it to that are maybe things that have happened in Columbia's history? Um, and that I can like research and kind of just weave into this like larger narrative. And so with the first story, the one of my, um, my great, great grandmother's finger in the bone, uh, finger bone in the bag, I figured my grandmother had told me that the reason that they had taken it and left their original place in Colombia was because of um, a big civil war that was happening called um, La Violencia in which Republicans and conservatives were kind of just killing, um, killing, killing liberals or people that they thought were liberals um, with basically, you know, impunity. And so that they would often leave this marker on the house of a family that they were going to target and that my grandmother's family maintained a bakery that they then found the marker on their house and a friend of theirs um, managed to help them escape. And so that this is why the bone was taken. As for the link to the La Señora con Tacones, that one was a little more interpretive. I kind of, you know, there was like, I think when you kind of start out with this and thinking like, why does someone disappear in like a country like Colombia? It's very easy to just immediately go towards like the very like dark and like depressing aspects of why someone would disappear. But given that I think that this first story that I chose was already kind of really heavy, um, I thought that it might be better to kind of explore something different with it. Like what are all of the different reasons she could have not come back? And so the link was kind of thinking about like, why does the Colombian diaspora leave Colombia? Um, and kind of where do they go from there? From that, um, you know, many rounds of revisions and design have kind of led to the final project that I'm about to show now. And that will be posted um, in the chat so that you all can view it on your by yourselves. So this is the kind of what I'm calling it, the anthology, and then the stories within this anthology is kind of how I view this project. And so this is kind of the main website that you kind of go to, or this anthology book that you would go to. with chiptune music and 
fun, like, interactive motions. And then from that, you would then click on the objects. So I'm going to just play through both of the stories, um, and some of the stuff is in Spanish, so I will translate it for those of you who are not Spanish speakers. So your, your sister said that there is a finger in the bathroom. They say that it is of your grandmother's. This night, you were going to figure out if it's true or not. Enter the bathroom. <laughs> Please, them know, not them. They are liberals. Why do you protect them? They are my neighbors, and they are good people. Please. I ask that you forgive them. All right, I will excuse them but that they must leave here now. Leave your business, leave your home, and leave your family. And do not come back. There is no place for liberals like you. And then I'll go through, so that was the first one around the finger in the bathroom, and I will go through the second one. You hear the senora con tacones at your window, but you don't see anyone. Every night she goes out to enjoy herself, but she doesn't know if she will return. Look from your window. A lot will be said about her disappearance. People will say she had been kidnapped. They will say her home was destroyed in the earthquake. They'll say that she left the mountains and could not find her way back. They'll say that her father's visa finally went to, through. She became a famous artist. She made a bakery in Queens her home. That her man could not keep his job and she left with him. She wanted a better life for her son. And that after building a new life, she was happier now.
is dedicated to my mom, my grandmother, and everyone else in my family. So these two projects, or these two stories, and the binding of the anthology are my personal project that I've worked on over the last three months at uh, Baby Castles. Along with that, as Flan, Flan sorry, stated, there is also a public uh, program component that I've been working on called DigiMyths, which kind of takes the lessons and the things that I've learned over the last three months and turns them into a um, educational workshop program that lasts about two weeks. We're currently hosting a Indiegogo for it. We've raised our initial goal, but we do have stretch goals around commissioning writers and affording risograph printing with the documentation book that comes out um, afterwards. So please check this out and I can drop those links as well. I would like to end on the note saying, oops, okay, this did not work. One sec. I'd like to end on the note saying thank you to all of these people, Andres Chang, Artemio Morales, Arnon, Tracy and Hyacinth who helped play test this game. Special thanks to my mom and my grandmother and Chantal Feitosa, my partner, who helped me just go through this game over the last three months as well. Thank you all. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Kevin. Super cool. Um, so I forgot to say at the top of the presentations that we're going to have time in chat um, for questions after each one. Um, so I'd like to open it up now to chat uh, if you have any questions about um, the interactive sites that we just saw or about Digimits. And I'll wait a few seconds for, for chat to catch up with us. Um, yeah. But yeah, I just want to say great work again. Thank you. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'm looking at the chat right now. So. Um, oh yeah, and I dropped the links in there. Um, uh, of those, so those should be there if anyone wants to check those out. Thanks, Juan. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Any questions? Anyone want to know anything? People think it's cool, okay. it seems. Um, I unmuted myself. Yes, I did. Cool. Kevin, what um, was the process of translating these stories to the design? Did you know what you were going to make before getting the stories? No, I didn't actually. I think, um, you know, when this, I spent about two weeks, kind of my partner sent me this, this, um, this app. And um, I spent about two weeks. I think it had already kind of been on my mind, this idea of like how to combine, um, you know, digital, like uh, traditional, like, like both the traditional and the digital in a way. Um, and so I thought that a good place to start would be with my family. And then I initially asked my grandmother and my family members for these different stories because this idea of digital folklore had been on my mind for, you know, a lot, a long time, but I hadn't really had any, um, any space to do it. I think, yeah, it was definitely, I spent about two weeks post getting those stories and getting the residency, kind of just researching all of the different angles I could take with this uh, project. And so given that there was like a finger in a bag and then there's this like object that is so central to the story, I kind of thought like, what are all the other objects around it to um, that could also be central to, to what's going on. And that could be used by both sides and allude to this like civil war that had happened. Um, similarly with La Senora con Tacones, I think, um, you know, that one was a little more freeform, but it kind of also followed this um, this idea of like also along with the stories, choosing maybe an interaction model that I wanted to use to kind of convey the story and to push the story forward. So with the first one, I was like, okay, if I have to choose like one main interactive component and that, what is it gonna be? And in this case, it was click. And so clicking kind of moves the story forward. I'm like, what can I do with click to build the story out? Or in the second one, um, for example, 
design. Um, yeah. If I chose text, like what is a way that text can be connected to the story and move it forward? I hope that answers your question. Nice, we have time for like one more question. If there's anyone else in chat who'd like to ask something. Please let me know. Any artists or <laughs> Andresito um, that I felt most influenced by? Yeah, I think um, Som, Som Bot, I think his, his work, if you all know him, he's a graphic designer currently working now, also went to RISD, I think his work and like how he fuses like traditional um, Indian and like South Asian aesthetics into like this very like digital means were very influential in that. I, I think also uh, another example is maybe like uh, if people know like Yellow Magic Orchestra uh, who were kind of musicians in like the 70s who took um, like these very like stereotypical like they're, they're from uh, East Asia and took like very stereotypical like um, kind of East Asian melodies or things that would be thought of a stereotype and kind of flipped it on its head by using kind of a lot of digital sounds. Uh, kind of 8-bit sounds, chiptune, like Atari stuff produced in Japan to kind of like I don't know, like play with it a shit, play with it a shit ton, play with it a lot and just kind of mess and subvert this like oriental uh, stereotype. So I would say that those two are kind of the ones that kind of come off the top of my head. And thanks, Cam. Uh, yeah, I, I also tried to think a lot about how to, how to kind of tie like the interaction that someone was doing and weave it into like, the, the way that the story progresses forward. Um, if people want, I can also post the links to the influences I spoke about. But um, yeah, again, thank you all so much. Thanks, Baby Castles. I'm really excited to see what the other residents do or showcase. Um, yeah, thank you again. Um, and thanks to everyone in chat um, for your questions and comments. Um, yeah, it's so nice to see like how far it's come. Next up, we're gonna hear from Rachel. Um, so I'll go ahead and let you take over. Cool. Uh, let me share my screen. Can everyone see? Okay. So hi everyone, I'm Rachel Lee and I'm an independent game developer based in Brooklyn, New York. And I just graduated from the MFA program at NYU Game Center this past May. And now I mainly make short first person games based on um, everyday experiences and observations. Um, and for this residency, the project I made is called um, Realistic Plant Growing Simulator. And Realistic Plant Growing Simulator um, is a game where players are given a mysterious plant and are asked to nurture it from a seed to a fully grown plant in a span of a week in real time. Um, and the project is first inspired by my experience growing plants at home. And after growing indoor plants such as succulents and scallions, and I found something very interesting about plant growing in real life that is not captured in um, games centered around plants and gardening. Um, and plant growing simulation games usually, uh, in my experience, um, evoke a feeling of contemplation and peacefulness and stability. And it, it, it does, it's usually does not have a fail state um, or the player, is, it, it's impossible to kill the plant. Whereas in um, real life, um, it is, the experience is much more challenging and unpredictable. Um, and the challenges and fun of plant growing in real life is first, plants are subtle and quiet. And so unlike animals, um, they appear much more static um, 
and less vocal about their needs. So it's really hard to tell what they need in a specific point in time, or even if they are still alive or not. And that's why it's very easy to lose track of time and forget about them or forget to water them. And when you come back, it's usually too late. So um, the challenge of uh, for gardeners is to observe the behavior of their plants carefully and understand their way of communicating their needs or what I call um, their signs, such as um, dots growing on the leaf or like a change in color on tip of leaf is usually very subtle and, and slow. Um, and how I captured this experience in, in my game is first um, from playing games that contain strong feelings of fear and anxiety, such as survival games and horror games, I realized that the player feels the most anxious or scared um, when some key information is hidden. And the scariest moment in that game is um, you do not, for example, you don't know when the monster is going to get you or why all of a sudden your sanity level is dropping um, out of nowhere. So I, I try to apply um, those rules in this game by concealing in information. So information such as how much water or sunlight a plant needs. Um, and players are only given very short and obscure instructions by the game. Uh, for example, down here it says, oh, make sure to, to keep it moisturized, but it doesn't tell you how much water exactly does the plant need. Um, and the only way to find out is to experiment. And, and by changing the variables such as the level of water in the soil, and look at how the plant reacts. And another thing is like in real life, um, you may fail and kill the plant. Either too much water or too, too little may cause the plant to slowly decay and eventually die. Um, and I realized the possibility of failing makes plant growing feel more rewarding when the player um, actually succeeds. And the way I capture the slowness of the plant is by making the game happen in real time. Um, so the plant would mature in a week in actual time. And also the plant's reaction to a change in the environment is um, often delayed. And players usually have to wait for a few hours to a day for the plant to react. So another key thing um, about the gameplay is patience. So <clears throat> yeah, so they should, the players need to constantly like remember to come back and then check on the plant. And yeah, and um, this everything together form an interesting dynamic between the feeling of uncertainty and also contemplation. And um, other ways I experimented to that makes the game feel more organic and real is to have um, diegetic UI, which is um, all the features are built into the world. So they are minimal screen UI. Um, so, so for example, the light switch is an actual light switch. And then the only way to figure out what they do is by exploring the game and interacting with all of them. And also, um, uh, everything reacts in a subtle way, such as on the right, the soil moisture um, is when, when there's more water in the pot, the color and the smoothness of the soil changes. Um, and I did other experiments such as generating custom mesh for the plants. So every time the plant would um, look slightly different and it feels more unique um, to the player. And yeah, um, lastly, I want to thank Baby Castles for giving me this chance to work on the game. Um, and this is something I always wanted to make and I'll probably never 
get the chance to make. Um, I want to thank Hyacinth and Fawn for supporting me and my work throughout this process. And I want to thank um, Lauren, Owen, um, Nicole, and Max, and all the other guests, critics, and playtesters for giving me um, so much valuable feedback and letting me know that my game is um, is valid and I'm not alone in making weird hardcore gardening simulations. And I will continue to work on and nurture this game and see it grow into its full grown form. <laughs> Thanks. Nice, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just said in chat, but um, we're open to uh, taking questions and, and comments now. Oh, I think we already have one. Um, Matt asks, uh, does the player keep the game running on their computer for a week or more? Um, so there is a, I'm still working on it, but there is a saving system. So you can just quit the game and then reopen it like next time. And yeah, it will, it will save all your progress. Yes. Um, someone else asks, uh, how many kinds of plants um, can I try to raise? Um, right now, there's only one due to the time limit. Um, but in the future, I'll keep working on it. And then once it's procedurally generated, then I'll have, like, I don't know, a lot <laughs> of different kinds of plants. Um, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll keep doing these kind of rapid fire. Um, another question, what's your uh, favorite kind of plant? Mm, that um, comes from Max. My favorite kind of plant is a type of succulent. I don't actually know the English of it, but in Chinese it's yulu, but it looks um, very chubby, like the leaves are like fat. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, one also, more, I'll, I'll do a couple. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, and also scallion because it's easy to grow. But <laughs> oh yeah, I do like regrowing um, used yeah. scallions. Um, I'll I'll do a couple more questions um, and then we'll uh, move on. Um, uh, another question is, uh, to what extent are the signs accurate to the plant? Um, will this teach me to be a better gardener IRL? Yeah, I think so. Because a lot of them actually, I, I drew ex experience from my real life. So say the tip of the plant would turn yellow. Um, it's just if it doesn't have enough water it's just in the game i change it to another crazy color like purple or blue um, but yeah it's basically the same um, principle and yeah but the the key thing is to be patient and observe <laughs> um one more um yeah not ask for clarification on um does the game st is it still uh, simulating time when the app is is closed yeah, so um, basically it um, records the time when you log off and then the next time you log in. So it would just calculate like the difference and then just, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, if there's not any more questions from chat, um, then I just want to say thanks again um, for presenting. Um, and yeah, the game is looking great now. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, always glad that baby castles can encourage um, other types of game mechanics. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, awesome. So uh, next up, um, we're gonna hear from Alan. Um, so go right ahead. Thanks, everyone. I'm Alan Pichardo. I'm a computational artist and a software engineer. Um, gonna share my screen a second. I've been working on an exploration game called Follow the Dr Follow the Drinking Gourd. Um, it's a game. It's a VR game where you are standing on the deck of a ship, and you discover constellations in the sky. Um, every star in the sky represents music uh, from throughout the America, throughout the uh, the African diaspora uh, in the American continent. And the point of the game is just to listen to music and make, make connections between 
the musics of, of various uh, cultures and, and how they relate to each other and try to link them back to um, ancient African cultures where those rhythms may have uh, originated. And the way that I do that is uh, I, I built a neural network that analyzes the music and tries to uh, categorize them by similarity um, to each other. And the main motivation behind uh, behind this work is basically my own fascination with my history um, from the Dominican Republic. Um, and I feel that as an African descendant here in this continent, my history uh, or the history of my ancestors kind of begins in America because it's very difficult to trace back anything that happened before the colonial period, um, at least, you know, in the, the written record. And in the last year, uh, maybe since 2019, I've been looking at artificial intelligence and trying to find ways in which I can apply the same data mining methods that are used to in a commercial way to predict the future, um, to try to use that to predict the past instead. And one thing that became apparent to me is that music is a historical record because there are shared traditions that have never gone away, um, even through uh, slavery and colonization. Uh, colonization. And there's instruments that are shared uh, even with these ancient cultures from, from Africa. <clears throat> so I started by uh, listening to music from different countries and trying to see like how similar they are, or how, how different they are. And thinking about how I could train a neural network to um, basically exploit those similarities so I can get a map of all this music. Uh, here I have, oh, sorry, here I have uh, two music clips, one from the Dominican Republic and one from Colombia. And these two, the neural network places them pretty closely. And it's mostly because they share uh, qualities in timbre and, and rhythm. I'll play some clips and, and we're gonna talk about it. So this is uh, bachata, which is one of the national musics of the Dominican Republic, where I'm from. And um, there's this. This is uh, cumbia music. At first glance, they might seem pretty, pretty different, um, but there are similarities in 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 the bass line and some of the timbres of um, the guitar tone and like the the vibraphone uh, tones. The neural network, in a mysterious way, analyzes the uh, these male spectrograms of the music and comes up with a map, an internal representation of how these different sounds are distributed. And then I use that to find the nearest, uh, the nearest neighbors to those sounds. So here I have, for example, um, from the data that I used to train this, um, one point in Angola, which happens to be, um, happens to be one of the places where most of my ancestors came from, or where like a lot of the Dominican culture uh, originated in ancient uh, Congo kingdom. <clears throat> but you can see that like nearby, you, you can see like all these other points, these all represent uh, different songs that I've used to, to train the, the network and where they come from. So just to 
just to show an example, like I have here some merengue, which is another like uh, one of the national uh, musical traditions of the Dominican Republic. And it's like guitar based merengue, which is one of the oldest forms of merengue. Uh, merengue now is mostly done by brass bands, but it actually started out with guitars. And I have some Angolan uh, music on the right. It is an album six, saving spent the next 61 years. Hey. One thing to note here is like, uh, there's this instrument called la guida, which is basically, it looks like a cheese grater that you play with like an Afro pick, but you scrape it um, and that's where you get the ch -ch 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 sound. And then here's the Angolan music. <laughs> So there's differences in that the Dominican sound, I could tell is a little bit more uh, Europeanized and relies a lot more on uh, bass guitar, whereas the, uh, the Angolan sound is more uh, drum based where it relies more on the uh, like the using the, the drums as the bass. And that's, um, that's just something that I found. And kind of interesting. Whoops. So uh, I'm gonna play one of the, as an example, one of the music sequences from the game. This is um, when you when you start when you start the game, you you start on the deck of the ship uh, with the star with the stars around you, and um, try to listen to the music as the constellations get made, and how how similar or dissimilar things might seem. Thank <laughs> you. 
So yeah, sometimes it's difficult to tell like how the music relates. That's why I think the crossfading effect kind of helps to put it together because sometimes it's obvious that it's a, a rhythmic similarity. Sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's obvious that it's a um, timbric similarity. Um, another component of the game is this map that is generated as you listen to, um, as you discover the constellations. Every time that a star connects to another star, um, it shows up on this map. And the way that I envision people playing this game um, is to, to, to do it in person, where multiple people will be, you know, over time playing the game and building up the map. And as you can see, this, this as the map gets more and more populated with these travels, it starts to resemble uh, the map on the right, which is uh, a map of the slave, the slave trade. Uh, something that I thought that was kind of interesting. So here's a, a clip of uh, one of the map uh, sequences. And it's just um, just to show how um, how the constellations relate to the map and game. I think exploring um, exploring this music, like in, in order to make this, I had to listen to a lot of music, and it really took me on a on a journey trying to like find out, you know, where these uh, traditions that I was brought up with actually come from, and learning about these ancient places that don't really get mentioned in a lot of history books, but um, their ancient kingdoms that lasted thousands of years, you know. Uh, so that was a very gratifying thing for me. I really hope that through something like this, it would inspire other um, other Black people and other uh, other African descendants to to look into their roots. Uh, and yeah, that's it. I want to thank uh, everyone uh, that has encouraged me through this. I want to thank Baby Castles, uh, Flan and Hyacinth, and Lee and Laura, and, and all the residents for all of their um, feedback and encouragement throughout this project. Thank you. Thanks for all this great music, Alan. <laughs> yeah. Good to listen to. Does anyone oh, have thank any you questions? so much. Um,
yeah, it's been uh, really cool seeing this project come together. Um, yeah. Machine learning is always something that's super interesting to me. Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, one question. I don't know if uh, you have the answer for this yet, but someone asks if this is going to be in any uh, museums or galleries. Uh, the yeah, I, I want to this. I want to display this physically. That's why I haven't like released it. Um, I thought about releasing it through something like SideQuest because it's a it's it's a uh, it's a quest game. But first, I want to try to show it at a gallery because I think that people would get more from it when they get to share it and to experience it in uh, in person. So hopefully, like I think uh, COVID has kind of like put a damp you know, has dampened that because, you know, it, it's just not super safe to like put a stranger's VR headset on your face, but I, that's what I hope to do maybe this year. Nice, cool. and I think that answered um, another question from earlier, but someone was asking if they could play it on the Quest 2. Um, but yeah, I think since you said it's a Quest game, the answer is yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the game relies on this back end that I made. Um, Right now, I'm trying to figure out the cheapest way to do it. If I do distribute it on for the quest, like on SideQuest, um, I need to figure out like a cheap way to host that because right now it would be too expensive to to have like the the, the machine learning backend hosted that way. But I will figure that out. Um, nice. Yeah, people can post more questions. I wanted to go back to a comment from earlier because. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're talking about it being like um, an art piece, but um, Romani pointed out that um, this can uh, inform questions for further research um, just by like looking at the, the data and stuff. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think that there's like so much more that can be done with this, you know, maybe with someone that's a little bit more capable, but um, for me, just, just working on it, I, I had to learn a lot about you know where these rhythms originated and then that just got me like uh to you know look at my own family and like you know what do they do what do they grow up doing what kind of instruments people are playing in the Dominican Republic what, what, what kind of music people are making in Haiti what kind of music people are making in Cuba like etc so it, it was a great journey um, oh, Kevin uh, just asked if you have to post your questions to chat. No, you're on the call, so yeah, go go ahead if you have a question. <laughs> oh yeah, cool. Yeah, I just was uh, I was curious if you had like so you chose like this wave like sh sh um, music using music as a historical record. I was wondering if you maybe this is informed by that person's comment of like this could be used to further research. Are there other ways you could see this like neural network being used or other ways you considered using it? Or I'm just, yeah, like interested, like, you know, you kind of chose this path, but are there other ways you were like, oh, it could also go this way or, you know, it could also do this once, you know, this version of it has been finalized. Well, the way that it, it really started was I was doing some research on um, sound search methods. And um, I was looking at um, Google Sound Search and the way that they do things. Um, so this thing actually is really good for searching for sounds. Um, but then I, I just, I thought that was maybe too practical. What if you, you know, the, the sounds that you find are not the sounds you're looking for, but sounds that you didn't know were there. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's there's a lot that could be done with this, and it could it, it could be even better than it is. I just didn't have that much. Um, first, I had to like learn how to do it, and then also like I didn't have a huge uh, data set of music F for this one. I used Spotify um, because Spotify lets you pull thirty second clips, and then I just made like tons and tons and tons and tons of playlists of music from like different countries, and then had those had like the API just pull from those and use those for the training. It's similar to a question that Circa asked in chat, which is uh, how many pieces well, of Well, there's a couple more questions in oh. chat that I'll read. Um, oh, although they might've been slightly answered um, by the, the last question. Um, but um, Bomani also asks, uh, love the project. By looking at this, I feel like I was inspired to think of a bunch of new questions. Um, for example, bi-directional or transcultural influence between different parts 
um, of the African diaspora, et cetera. Uh, I'm really curious about what your next steps for this project might be. What further questions did making this inspire for you? Um, so I think you, you kind of brought up like one one of the further questions, which is like looking for sound or finding sound similarities that you weren't looking for. Um, but are there other um, sort of questions that you want to explore? Yeah, I think that something that would be interesting to look at is uh, the instruments themselves, because if you really want to get to the bottom of like the origins of this music, like, yes, you can look at the rhythms and and those like higher level qualities of the of the music, but you can also look at like the super granular and just look at the instruments themselves. But I think that that would take a little bit more than just the AI, like it would have to be a little bit more like human driven for you to say like, okay, great, we've got these uh, instruments, like uh, we've got uh, we've got these instruments in the Dominican Republic called palos, and they're basically like these super long congas. And um, you look at the palo there, and then you can look at like tumbadoras in Cuba and see like how how did that get there? Um, that probably would give you like a much more accurate representation of like the lineage of, of the music because there is a lot of like cross pollination of this music in the United States. I'm sure a lot of um, a lot of traditional African music is 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 vocal. And when it wasn't, then it became guitar based and then it became, you know, these this full band based. And when you listen to African music that's like that, that music is influenced by American music. So there, you know, there is that that back and forth. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, nice. Um there's uh maybe a couple more questions in chat. Um or you may have already answered how many pieces of uh, music were analyzed uh, for the neural network? Um, I think it's something like a couple of that, maybe 8,000 or something like that. And um, I wasn't like, <laughs> I could have probably been a lot more diligent about like cleaning up the data set, but I'm pretty sure some of the songs were repeated, which is not great, but um, I was lucky enough that Spotify did let me download that uh, that music because then I could automate it and I didn't have to like manually like look for it. When I made the prototype for this thing, I had to manually put together all of the all of the data set um, and I was only able to like get together like a couple of hundred songs and uh, it wasn't as uh, robust. Awesome. Uh, we're gonna uh, move on now. Um, but if you wanna, if if you wanna like discuss further with people in chat, feel free to to hop in on Twitch. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we have one more presentation for you. Um, so Kanye's gonna talk next. Um, so yeah, take it away. Thank you. Um, let me just share my screen. Um, are you are you seeing that in in presentation mode? Because that's all I see now. <laughs> I will assume that's a yes. I can't yes. I can't see anything. Yes. Oh, thank you. Great. Uh, hey. Um, so my name is Sukanya, and um, I've been the SO Lang maker in residence for the past three months at Baby Castles. Um, so Esolang is uh, short for esoteric programming language. And um, so most of the mainstream programming languages that we know of are generally about these kinds of things and uh, very centered around utility and efficiency. Um, the programming language is basically just a way of communicating with a machine and giving it instructions in a very precise and unambiguous way. Um, and so, oops. So esoteric programming languages, um, rather than you know focusing on things like utility and efficiency, um, they're sort of pushing the bounds of what a programming language can be. Um, and some of them are made as jokes or as commentary on uh, existing languages, or as um, some of them are almost like uh, puzzles or challenges to try to write something, to program something within a very tight set of um, constraints. 
Um, so just a little bit about some of the um, some esoteric languages out there. This is uh, the language Intercal, which was one of the first esoteric languages created. Um, and it was a sort of commentary on the commanding nature of programming languages at that time. So in Intercal, a programmer needs to use the word please before um, writing commands. And if they don't use it enough, they get an error. And if they use it too much, they also get an error. Um, this is the language BrainFuck that uses uh, exactly eight characters. Um, so its meaning is completely obfuscated to a human reading it, but for a machine, it comes down to the same thing. And I think this sort of sheds light on the, the design space of a programming language, that there's design decisions that go into making it readable for humans and catering to human cognition. Um, this is the language Payette, which instead of using just uh, a one-dimensional, um, you know, a string, essentially, a string of text to uh, give the computer instructions. It works on a two-dimensional grid to instruct the computer. Um, and these are the languages Shakespeare and Chef. Um, they both look like natural languages. Um, in Shakespeare, a program is written in the form of a cooking recipe. And um, sorry, in Chef, it's a cooking recipe. And in Shakespeare, it looks like a Shakespearean play. Um, and this is what I was really drawn to, the idea of a, of a programming language that could look like a natural language and could hold meaning to somebody reading just the program. Because um, uh, often with code, it's like you only see the result of it, but you don't really see the code itself. So I thought there was something uh, really appealing about this. Um, and so the project that I've been working on is called Inverse, um, which I actually started working on earlier um, last year. And um, through the residency, I've uh, worked on a little more. So it's, uh, it's a programming language that looks like poetry. And it's uh, used to create visuals and animations. And it does that by um, through the use of shaders. And it lives in a live coding uh, web interface. Um, so this is a kind of demo of it being used. Uh, every time the Enter key is hit, the code compiles. And uh, you can see the shader change uh, right there. Um, and so some of the design decisions that went into this was that I wanted it wanted both the program and the output to be something that could be interesting to a wide audience uh, beyond just programmers or people interested in programming language theory. Um, and to have several ways of writing the same program. Um, and unlike Chef or Shakespeare, where it's like a, the, there's a specific structure to each of the programs, I wanted to try to break out of that so that you know, it, literally anything could almost um, be a, a program. Um, and I wanted there to be a certain degree of randomness, a bit of uh, loss of control and some slowness, um, which is kind of anti the way normal programming languages work. Um, and that um, they would be engaging to create with, again, not just for someone coming from a programming background. And so this is some of the work that people have made with Inverse already. Um, this one was uh, particularly interesting because the words and the visuals start to start to tie up. It's a haiku by Rio Khan. Um, this was another interesting example, which uh, I totally didn't expect anyone to play around with the arrangement of text. Um, so just a little bit more on how it works, and it's uh, it, it's it's always a little it's it's always a little difficult for me to talk about this project in some sense without really going into the weeds. Um, so I'm I'm going to try to sort of breeze over stuff uh, without really well, getting into a tutorial <laughs> essentially. Um, so the the use of shaders was just because I think you know creating visual output is something that um, that that does appeal to everyone in some sense. Um, and it's also a very constrained problem space. So a shader basically just takes an X, the x and y coordinate of a pixel as input and returns red, green, and blue values as output. So it's, it stays within a completely numeric space. Um, the, the other component of this is this idea of word mapping. So much like any programming language, there's, you know, there's certain keywords. Um, and in shaders, these are often like mathematical functions, so sine and cos and tan. 
but instead of using those words you can uh, you can choose what words you want to use to assign to them um, and so the interface what you see on the right the interface has like some word mappings that i created um, which are created by extracting words from bodies of text so there's some from Aesop's fables some Britney Spears lyrics some Jim Morrison lyrics um, and in the middle, what you see is uh, you could go and just create your own word table from scratch. Um, there's also this idea of shuffling. So it's you can shuffle the way the words are mapped onto the shader functions, which will lead to a completely different shader generally as a result of that. Um, and it works on a using a stack-based paradigm, which is um, a little different from sort of most normal programming languages one might be used to. Um, it, it basically gets around this issue of uh, variable assignment, like it's to, to, to translate variable assignment into a natural language without it looking really contrived is a bit difficult. And so um, a stack-based paradigm sort of gets, get, gets past that in a way. Um, it also, one of the sort of side effects that came out of doing this is that uh, a program in inverse never crashes. So there's, there's only one type of error you can have in a stack when you're, when you're trying to retrieve data that doesn't exist. And in inverse, you're just uh, given back random data instead. And since it's always numeric, you just get a random number and everything keeps working. Um, there's also an online gallery, and uh, you can go and fork somebody else's work and start working on it. Um, so all of this had happened sort of last year before the residency. And uh, my plan for the residency was to focus on a couple of things. The, for the first part was um, to use any language. So since you can assign words to shader functions, in, in theory, this could work with any language. Um, However, with, with non-Latin scripts, there was things were starting to break, so it needed some, some work to make that, um, to make that work. Um, the other part that I was thinking about was collaborative live coding. Um, from sharing this with people, I found that people with, um, with a background, you know, with familiarity with shaders or people who liked writing, they both um, they saw some appeal in this, and I thought it would be interesting to to have collaborative live coding for people coming from sort of different perspectives um, to be kind of, uh, to be able to sort of jam together. And the other thing was to add uh, more features. So the way shaders work, it's sometimes really cumbersome to do something even simple like draw a circle. Um, so I wanted to sort of just add more stuff to make it a little more expressive. No, yeah, things, things don't always go according to plan. Um, so the, the, I'm going to just go over a lot of stuff that happened, but not really in chronological order. Um, so I, I held a workshop in December through Kodame. There was the, the, the mid, midway presentations in December. And then there was uh, initial rounds before this residency when I shared this, uh, when I shared this with people. And there's a whole bunch of feedback that I received about how you know it, it's not not very approachable and it can be a little confusing it's not so clear how to connect the visuals to the words and hard to understand what's happening in the stack um, there's also people who saw potential for this as a performance tool and thought there was a nice tension between letting the words or the visuals drive and um, people got curious about shaders but i thought it was really interesting um, about giving these like math functions your own words made them seem less intimidating. Um, there was also in, interest in contributing to the code base. Um, and I was also asked well, what, what the goal of the project was. Um, and I think sort of all of this together made me kind of realize how I needed to sort of step back from it. Um, the, the implementation that had happened happened in the context of uh, a grad school thesis project. So it was, uh, admittedly a bit rushed and things ended up being slapped together a little bit. And I found that I was feeling a little tied down to, to the code in its current form and you know trying to sort of carefully make changes while not breaking things. Um, but it, it started to hold me back a bit. Um, and so it, it felt like a good idea to kind of step back and sort of uh, zoom out a little bit. And so in thinking about the goals, um, one, I wanted to be as an engaging creative tool, um, one that sort of puts you in an interesting headspace while you're using it. 
um, which I found, at least for me, sort of held true. Um, so I've like experienced writing shaders, but I, do, I don't write poetry at all. And trying to write a shader while sort of weaving together a story was definitely a very interesting experience. Um, and I w wanted it to um, be something that you could keep going back to and keep using rather than just something you, you know you play around with once and that's about it um, and also retain the fact that it does appeal to people coming from different backgrounds so there have been people who have been looking at this um, from performance perspective or you know far more interested in the writing or or the you know the sort of puzzle of trying to write a shader in a stack and you know put, put words to it and uh, something that kind of grows with community, both in terms of the, the code base and in terms of how people can engage with each other's work um, through the tool. And so I started thinking about this in sort of four buckets of um, expressiveness, transparency, playfulness, and community, um, with the expressiveness just to be able to do more with less effort um, and to get more insight into what's going on. Um, and the playfulness was like, you know, more around having uh, more immediacy so that you could mess around a little bit, kind of like how the, the shuffle function allows you to do that right now. And um, for the community part of more ways to engage, um, I was thinking it could be cool to have, um, instead of just forking the completed work that someone's done, to be able to share just a word mapping, for example, so you could see you know, uh, 10, 10 different things that people have made with this one word mapping. Um, so it's almost like a constraint-based writing exercise. Um, so I've started rewriting the whole thing and working in a sort of modular way so that I'm not um, tied into, into any of the existing structure and that I can kind of play around in little pieces and, you know, as, as I'm starting to see what's working and what's not working, sort of slowly build it back up together. Um, so one of the first things that I worked on was getting this working with non-Latin scripts. Um, there's obviously a heavy bias towards Latin scripts in anything code related. So even debugging this was um, a bit of a challenge because there's different text encoding on your text editor, on the terminal, on the browser, there's you know different fonts come into play. Um, what I found out was that uh, Chrome has a bug with with scripts like Hindi, which have uh, joining characters. So if anyone out there is trying something similar, just stay away from Chrome. Um, one of the other things I did was working on higher order functions. So like I was saying, even drawing a circle or a triangle is not really trivial in, um, in shader world. Um, so I started adding functions that let you do that. And what you see on the on the left is like that whole mess of code is a sort of representation of, of the stack. So I'm, I'm breaking out of the interface and just uh, I created a way for me to be able to kind of quickly test with the stack, um, you know, how it would work to have a function like this and how complex it would be. And I think this already adds uh, quite a bit. Like if you put a triangle on top of a square, you know, Pretty much anyone sees a house immediately. So I think it does uh, give a little more sort of uh, potential to be able to visually express ideas. Um, the other thing was the ability to add images or textures. Um, and then you know you could take the, the pixel data from an image and use it in the shader however you want. Um, Again, I think this also adds a bit um, of that uh, expressiveness to how the tool can be used. Um, like for me, this this picture and this effect uh, sort of speaks to the the time bending that's been happening the past year of time stretching and squashing. Um, one of the other things was working on the stacks. So. Like I was saying, people found it was uh, it was hard to kind of tell what was going on since it's a sort of non-traditional way of representing a program. And so it, it took quite a bit of reworking to um, to get to get this working. And what this is basically doing is showing you for any function when you hover over it, what the arguments are to that function. And when you hover over the stack in general, it shows you, you know, the what what pieces are going to land up in your red, green, and blue channels for the shader. Um, 
I also worked on better code generation. So what you see on the left, that, that long line at the bottom, that's, that's the shader code that was being generated um, in its current form. And on the right is a sort of um, opened out, like the, the, what's being generated right now. And the, the motivation behind doing this was, um, you know, you, you could, in theory, take the shader that you write in inverse and use it anywhere else. Or if, you know, if, if you're comfortable enough with shaders and you're really trying to debug something, it's, it's almost impossible to see what's going on. With, with the version on the left. And it also had um, some inefficiencies with the way that was working. Um, so I, the version on the right also still has some inefficiencies, but it's at least it's a little more readable. And it's, uh, you know, if you wanted to modify it outside of the platform, it's a little easier to do that. I also worked on documentation, which was initially quite a challenge when I had explained it to people. Um, so this is kind of uh, the structure that I used for the workshop that I did in December. Um, and since, the, since there's all these little, these different pieces to, to how it works, um, it was a little bit overwhelming when I, you know, held workshops in the past. Um, but I sort of worked through uh, sort of more sensible order of going through, uh, going through all the, the different parts of, of using inverse. So it was a turn into a little more of a gentle uh, introduction, and I think it's like started to serve as a um, a good foundation for building the documentation, which will you know obviously include all of the other stuff that I've been adding. Um, and lastly, um, I started writing tests because I found myself feeling extremely hesitant uh, trying to change things and fix things. Um, I, I, put, I put the code away for a couple of months, and um, I'm sure there's probably many people who've had a similar feeling of just not wanting to go anywhere near it and really scared of what's going to happen the second you change something. Um, and part of the reason to sort of share this is because I think a lot of what Inverse is about is um, you know, the, the code not being this hidden thing that's just used to produce some output, but you know, the code itself is, is, is a thing. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of craft and uh, poetry to, to code itself, and which is why I thought it'd be nice to actually share what, what, what the tests looked like and to share that this was also a part of the process. Um, and there's, there's a whole, whole bunch more to do. I have a long list sort of um, building. So one of the ideas was to be able to change the word mappings on the fly, so you could be writing something and you know, you might want to use a function. You can just change the word that that's assigned to that function to make it work for whatever you're trying to write. Um, and to um, programmatically extract words from a body of text. So the the mappings I had generated were already doing this, but there's no there's no interface for this. So you know, maybe if there's an author or a poet you really like, you could upload a piece of text or copy paste it in and uh, have it generate a word mapping for you to use. Um, so there's, um, while it does support multiple languages and scripts, it still doesn't do right to left. So that's another thing to add. Um, and sort of rethinking the, the interface, the gallery, the whole sort of interaction on how you share and fork. Um, Thinking about more inputs, such as mouse input or the microphone could be another source of uh, another data source. Um, and then, of course, the collaborative live coding part, which I <laughs> didn't manage to get to in the past few months. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, thank you. And thank you to, to everyone at Baby Castles for, for supporting this residency. I'm really glad to have had this opportunity and to uh, Flan and Hyacinth and um, the other residents and all the guest critics who came. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, another uh, just super cool project. Um, so I've already said to send questions in chat. Someone um, was just mentioning um, that they're a playwright um, and we're really interested in seeing uh, what screenplays would look like uh, in inverse. Um, yes, lots of claps in chat as well. Um, so yeah, um, send in questions and comments. Thanks. Yeah, screenplays would be that would be awesome. There's uh, there's currently some there's a few sort of syntactical 
features, like there's some punctuation marks which basically have meaning. So I was immediately thinking of things like a semicolon and stuff and how that might translate or additional meaning that it could have specifically for that kind of context. Um, also want to give some time for all the residents um, if you want to drop links to your social media or wherever people um, can keep up with your projects, uh, if you're going to um, be posting any updates to those. Um, I know Alan posted um, his Twitter in the chat earlier, um, but yeah, so I'll give you a minute to post those. Also, if you're not on Twitch, you can send me the links and, and I can put them in chat for you. Um, okay, so Bomani uh, says, such an interesting project. Um, love how the code is allowed to be a part of the creation and enjoy hearing about the references to other SO lines. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, links are going in chat. Um, and also stay tuned uh, to Baby Castles um, for future announcements about um, more sessions of the residency. Um, definitely planning um, on doing this again. So um, don't know yet when we're gonna open applications up, but um, yeah, we'll stay tuned for updates. Um, but yeah, thanks again so much, all of you uh, for sharing your work and um, for doing this first round of the residency with us. Um, it was really a pleasure. Um, I'm excited to keep seeing uh, where the work continues on from here. Yeah, likewise. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The baby castles. So I'll keep it going um, for a few more minutes, just in case chat has got any, any more questions for, for any of the residents that, that people want to get in at the last minute. And, you know, uh, if uh, we're like, I think everyone here is in, in our Discord also. Oh, Stan, I think you're muted if you're oh. trying to talk. Am I not muted now? Yes, we can hear you. That's why it seemed like you, like earlier you cut me off to say what <laughs> I was saying. And I was like, that was weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's fine <laughs> but that explains a lot of things um, I, I think I, I was piping out to stream also so that was like maybe doubly weird <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah so um, I was just saying y'all everyone in chat to join, your, join our discord if you if you want mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah I can post the invite link for that yeah um, and I think that everyone everyone here is, is there also. So if you want to like talk off mic or anything like that, I'm just, you know don't want to speak for anyone, but I'm pretty sure that that folks here would be be down to talk about what what they're they're working on as as things developed, post updates, etc. Um, and yeah, you should uh, definitely go check out um, uh, the Indiegogo for Digimyths because that's shaping up to be really super cool. Um, mm -hmm. Any other the stuff that we want to like plug? while in in the last um, that is a really good question that i don't necessarily have anything for but if any of the residents want to plug anything that they have um that they haven't already uh definitely go for it yeah got um uh, the digimits indiegogo link is in chat as well um i guess we can plug word hack um definitely tune into the, the word hacks as they come every month yeah. Um, the next game of the month club at Baby Castle is going to be Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, and we're still looking for speakers. So if you want to speak on Roller Coaster Tycoon 2, uh, just just get in touch yeah, with, uh, uh, with anyone on Discord. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for coming, hanging out, watching uh, some cool people talk about some cool stuff that they're working on. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I'll leave the stream yeah. running for a bit if anyone wants um, to like get any last things in, but that that's basically it. Uh, yeah, thanks again to Max, yeah. uh, who's yeah, in so, chat. Thanks again, Max. 
um, without him, this whole thing wouldn't happen. So, uh, very grateful there. Congrats, y'all. Yep. Three very crazy months. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna go take a nap after this, I think. Uh, I wish. <laughs> That's actually a lie. <laughs> but tomorrow I'll be able to nap a little bit, I think. Um Yes, uh I'm I'm gonna kill the stream now, I think. So uh take care hey. y'all. Um, have a great Bye, rest of your all. evening. Uh, thank you. Congratulations again, residents. You, you did it. Uh, I'm very excited about everything that came came out of this. And um, yeah, uh, excited to see where it all goes. Yeah, it's very, very cool to see interactivity used in like so many different ways um, yeah. that are all really interesting. So yeah. yeah. Cool. Yes. All right, good night, chat. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.